Good evening, everyone. Both those that are physically present with us in the Port of Philip Auditorium and those that are joining us online. This annual lecture at St. Vargas Orthodox Theological Seminary bears the name of our beloved and well known former Dean, Father Alexander Schmemann. The multiple parameters of this annual event approximate the Orthodox aspirations for scholarship that sees itself as rooted in the life in Christ, in the service of spiritual intellectual growth, and relevant to the time and place in which we find ourselves fighting for our salvation. It is a theological lecture drawing on the treasures of the Orthodox Christian intellectual tradition in the twofold way articulated by our distinguished predecessors. On the one hand, we continue to contemplate the truth and beauty of tradition, for authentic theology must always remain a student and disciple of those sanctified men and women of God, both the biblical patriarchs and prophets, apostles and evangelists, and the later fathers who in every place and every age have certified the possibility of being fully alive in Christ. On the other hand, faithfulness to the tradition means taking seriously the word in which the word of God speaks the words of eternal life and into which he has descended to manifest God's love unreservedly, sacrificially, and redemptively. The treasures that we find inherited from the Church Fathers are not there to be stored at our exclusive possession, and it is even less a collection of intellectual arguments to be employed against others. It is true that we are the first beneficiaries, but these are treasures we are to preserve and to share with anyone willing to taste and rejoice over the resources of Orthodox thought and life. We have just completed Father Alexander Schmemann's centennial celebration, in which these very institutions have honored his luminous memory with a number of events, both liturgical and scholarly. Among the latter are a number of articles published in the quarterly, authored by Daniela Augustin, Deacon Nicholas Denisenko, and Ruan Bessa, also, St. Vladimir's annual academic symposium, the first in a new annual series, was planned to bring together 10 of the most notable scholars of liturgical theology from North America and Europe. And even though the pandemic ruined our initial plans for October 2021, this symposium will convene in person in October 2022. Finally, the Schmemann Centennial culminates with the evening's this evening's lecture. The guest of the Schmemann lecture is the Reverend Father Khaled Anatolius, a scholar of the early church fathers who holds the distinguished position of John A. O'Brien, Professor of Theology at the University of Notre Dame. He is the author of two influential books on St. Athanasius of Alexandria and one on the Council of Nicaea. The first is Athanasius, the coherence of his thought published with Rowledge in 1998 and republished in 2004. The second is Athanasius, a monograph published for the Early Church Father series, both uh, again with Rowledge in 2004. The third is Retrieving Nicaea, the de Development and Meaning of Trinitarian Dro uh, Doctrine, published with Baker Academic in 2011 and republished in 2018. And very recently, he also published an ambitious work titled Deification Through the Cross, an Eastern Christian Theology of Salvation with Hermans in 2020. We salute in this year's speaker not only a scholar who has done much to teach us about the fathers, but also a devout Byzantine Catholic priest who is a close friend of the Orthodox Church. The title of Father Khaled's address is Salvation as Liturgy, Alexander Schmemann's the Liturgical Theology and the Renewal of the Joy of Salvation. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest the speaker of the 39th annual Father Alexander Schmemann Lecture at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary, Father Khaled Anatolios. Thank you, Professor Tudori, for this very gracious introduction. I am deeply grateful to you and to Father Chad Hatfield uh, 
and to the entire community of St. Vladimir's Seminary for your gracious and truly spirit-filled hospitality, and especially for the honor and privilege of the invitation to share with you some reflections on the occasion of the Father Schmemann Memorial Lecture. The significance of this event is for me deeply personal. Though I have never met Father Schmemann in person, his writings have had so great an impact on me over the years as to warrant my counting him as both a theological mentor and even, I would say, a spiritual father. Until recently, my indebtedness, both personal and professional, to the work and witness of Father Schmemann has been largely hidden. My own scholarly work did not follow, at least on the, first foot, uh, on the surface, in the footsteps of Father Schmemann. I have focused principally not on the history and theology of the liturgy, but on the historical development of conciliar dogmatic theology, especially Trinitarian theology and Christology. Yet I hope that my work has always been done, albeit implicitly, in the key of a liturgical theology in the wider sense advocated by Father Schmemann, which is to say, a theology that is anchored in and oriented to the actualization and performance of the saving presence and work of the Holy Trinity in the divine liturgy and the life of the church. However, this latent influence of the work and spirit of Father Schmemann on my own work became explicit in my latest book, Deification Through the Cross and Eastern Christian Theology of Salvation. This book implements Father Schmemann's insistence on the liturgical foundation of all genuine theology by drawing a theology of salvation directly out of Byzantine liturgical experience and demonstrating that in a real sense, salvation simply is liturgy. Hence the title of this talk, Salvation as Liturgy. When I first received the invitation to give this memorial lecture in honor of Father Schmemann, I knew immediately that its content had to take the form somehow of an acknowledgement and celebration of my own indebtedness to Father Schmemann's work and witness. Though I'm somewhat uncomfortably aware of the self-referential element embedded in this approach, my hope is that such self-reference will be redeemed by expressing itself in the mode of a thankful indebtedness and a personal testimony to the enduring generativity of Father Schmemann's theological vision. At the same time, I'm happy to make use of this occasion to extend my debt to Father Schmemann even further by exploring aspects of his theological vision that I, did, that I did not treat in my book, but which give further substantiation, I believe, to its core argument. So my remarks this evening will be divided into three parts. In the first part, I will briskly summarize the method and essential thesis of my book, Deification Through the Cross, with a view to acknowledging the formative influence of Father Schmemann's work on this project. In the second part, I will draw attention to some of the elements of Father Schmemann's thought that I did not have a chance to treat in this book, but which I believe add greater richness to my proposed conception of Christian salvation. Finally, I will conclude with a brief reflection of how, on how Father Schmemann's soteriological vision which was so thoroughly permeated with the tonality of joy and so insistent that the message of salvation is ineluctably a message of joy, can still be applicable in the present existential moment which seems so inhospitable to both natural and supernatural joy. So my first part then, consisting of a summary of my soteriological proposal intermingled with confessions of my indebtedness to Father Schmemann. One of the guiding scriptural signposts that underlie my proposed conception of Christian salvation is the great 
penitential psalm, Psalm 50 in the Septuagint. This psalm, as I think all of you know, is recited every day in the service of Orthros and is silently recited by the priest or deacon during the various insensations of the divine liturgy. It is in the first place a psalm of repentance, consisting of a confession of sin and a plea for forgiveness. In the midst of this expression of repentance, the psalmist cries out, restore to me the joy of your salvation. The psalmist concludes by offering a combination of praise and contrition as the sacrifice pleasing to the Lord. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not spurn. The contents of this psalm contain the foundational premise of this book, that salvation can be appropriately understood as doxological contrition, the capacity to render to God a sacrifice of joyful praise that is simultaneously an offering of contrition. The petition of the psalmist, restore to me the joy of your salvation, comprises the opening words of my book, Deification Through the Cross. And the goal of the whole book is to transpose this petition into the mode of theological discourse. Positively, it seeks to recover and elucidate the intelligibility and credibility of the church's faith that this prayer has in fact already been answered in Jesus Christ. Negatively, it seeks to address what seems to be the general loss of this joy of salvation among modern Christians and its replacement by a general befuddlement, confusion, and often embarrassment with regard to the Christian teaching that the salvation of humanity and the entire cosmos has come about through the incarnation, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the church. Academic theology, it seems to me, has contributed to this befuddlement by stipulating that there is no normative doctrine of salvation in the Christian tradition, and that the only legitimate approach to understanding this doctrine is to attend to the various metaphors around which so-called models of salvation have grown in the Christian tradition, metaphors such as ransom, redemption, repayment of debt, satisfaction, the victory of Christ. According to this models of salvation approach, the first step in dealing with these metaphors is to explore the historical and social context which gave rise to them. Not surprisingly, such exploration does not typically yield a sense of concrete familiarity with the reality supposedly signified by these metaphors, but rather enhances the sense that the traditional Christian formulations of this doctrine are alien to our contemporary experience. Now it's true enough that the Christian tradition beginning with the scriptures themselves uses a plethora of images to signify the irreducible mystery of Christian salvation. But what is usually ignored by the models of salvation approach is the fact that the mysterious reality of Christian salvation is something to which we do have concrete experiential access precisely in the liturgy. Liturgy is where salvation happens. And all the metaphorical and doctrinal descriptions of the reality of salvation can only properly signify if they are brought into intelligible relation with our liturgical experience of salvation that salvation manifestly happens in the liturgy in a way that can and should be consciously recognized and appropriated is something to which the liturgy itself testifies. At the end of Vespers, we repeat the biblical prayer of Simeon the just, now you may dismiss your servant in peace, O Lord, for my eyes have seen your salvation. 
in the anaphora prayer of the Divine Liturgy, the recitation of God's saving benefits comes to a climax in recognizing that the liturgy itself is the supreme gift of salvation for which we give thanks. For all these things we thank you and your only begotten Son and your Holy Spirit, for all these blessings, both known and unknown, manifest and hidden, that were lavished upon us, we thank you also for this liturgy, which you are pleased to accept from our hands. After communion, when the priest prays explicitly for salvation, saying, Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. The people respond by testifying that indeed they have experienced that salvation precisely in the present moment of liturgical worship. We have seen the true light. Have we or haven't we? We have seen the true light. We have received the heavenly spirit. We have found the true faith worshiping the undivided Trinity who has saved us. If we take seriously the claim that the liturgy itself makes to be not only an efficacious mediation, but also the manifestation and enactment of Christian salvation, then our starting point for understanding the various biblical metaphors of salvation should be the reality of salvation enacted and manifested in the liturgy itself. This is the starting point that I adopted in my book, and in doing so, I was consciously following the consistent directive of Father Schmemann that the new life in Christ and the Holy Spirit, and that salvation, is openly manifested and performed above all in the church's liturgical experience. In the methodological application of this strategy, I also took to heart Father Schmemann's claim that, quote, the liturgy of the Paschal Triduum reveals more about the doctrines of creation, fall, redemption, death, and resurrection than all the other loci theolog theologici together. And let me stress it, he goes on to say, not merely in the text, but precisely in the very experience given during these days. I extended the scope of Father Schmemann's claim, however, by including in my purview not only the Paschal Triduum, but the liturgical prayers of the entire Lenten season, as well as the Paschal season all the way to Pentecost. I also developed further Father Schmemann's implicit distinction between liturgical text and liturgical experience. In attending to the liturgical texts, considered simply in their signification of external realities, I endeavored to draw out what these texts say about creation, sin, and redemption, the constituent elements of an integral doctrine of salvation. Among other discoveries that arose from this scrutiny, I noted a consistent doxological coefficient in the formulation of these themes. The original condition of human creation is described in these texts as being clothed with divine glory. Sin is depicted as an estrangement from divine glory being exiled from divine glory. While salvation is envisioned as a return to divine glory that is completed in Christ through his ascension into heaven and enthronement at the right hand of the divine majesty. That's how we return finally to, glo to glory when our human nature, as it says in the, in, the, in the liturgical text, is enthroned at the right hand of the divine majesty with Christ in his ascension. But especially by trying to draw the inner configuration of liturgical experience, that we're led to, to the characterization of that experience as doxological contrition. In many ways, both all obvious and subtle, the liturgy initiates the worshiper into the self-description of someone caught up in a mutually reinforcing dialectic of praise and repentance. Thus, to take just one example, the worshiper is invited to cry out in the Compline service of Monday in the first week of Lent, attend, O heaven, and I shall speak, give ear, O earth, to the voice of one who repents before God and sings his praise. Repents and sings praise. 
If we can speak of a dialectic of already not yet in Christian salvation, then the liturgical experience of salvation as doxological contrition envelops both sides of this dialectic. In liturgical, liturgical worship, the glory of God is already perceived and celebrated, while not yet fully assimilated. The very perception of divine glory, which the liturgy mediates in abundance, both through sensible manifestations and the interior witness of the spirit, leads to a correlative perception of estrangement from that glory. Yet the lament over such its estrangement is counterbalanced and even mysteriously contradicted by the very perception and celebration of the very glory from which, confesses, from which one confesses to be estranged. There's thus a dialectic of lost and found glory that is foundational to the liturgically mediated experience of salvation as doxological contrition. Through contrition, the glory that is lost is also recovered but it's only recovered through our repentance through our repentance over the incompleteness of our assimilation to that glory. In his programmatic essay, Theology and Liturgy, Father Schmemann assigns to the work of theology the task of rendering transparent the law of belief, the lex credendi, that undergirds liturgical experience. If we accept such a correlation between theology and liturgy, which I do, then the characterization of the liturgical experience of salvation as doxological contrition requires integration with basic Christian doctrinal beliefs about creation, sin, redemption, etc., and especially the most central of these beliefs, Trinitarian and Christological doctrine. Again, following the guidance of Father Schmim and the rest of my book endeavors to perform this task by applying the characterization of liturgical experience as doxological contrition to scripture, and then to interior doctrine, and finally to a systematic exposition of Christian belief. And following this path, it was my expressed intention, again, to put into practice Father Schmemann's stipulation that liturgical experience should be the unifying factor and the overarching referent of all aspects of theological inquiry. As he says, biblical exegesis, historical analysis, doctrinal elaboration, ultimately converge in and prepare the celebration. The act of witnessing to and participating in the mystery itself. Our present time, constrained, uh, time constraints allow me to offer only a very brief synopsis of how the liturgical experience of doxological contrition, once subjected to the normative critique and enhancement supplied by scriptural exegesis and conciliar dogma, can inform the various elements of a systematic theology of Christian salvation. The first of these elements is a Trinitarian theology of mutual glorification which can be scripturally substantiated by the dramatization in the Gospel of John of how Jesus glorifies the Father and is himself glorified by the Father and the Spirit. This conception is further enriched by the notion elaborated by St. Basil the Great and St. Gregory of Nyssa that the human glorification of God in worship is grounded in the eternal mutual glorification of the co-equal persons of the Trinity. Human worship of God does not add glory to God, these Cappadocian fathers remind us. Rather, the human worship of God participates in a creaturely manner in the co-essential mutual glorification of the divine persons. And that's what happens in the liturgy. We join the mutual glorification of the Trinitarian persons. This understanding in turn provides a foundation for a radically doxological anthropology. The human being was created for no other reason than to praise and glorify God, just like the old, much maligned catechisms used to say. <laughs> 
So we can now understand this human vocation in terms of a participation in the eternal doxological relations between the divine persons. Such a radically doxological anthropology en enjoys strong resonance with the Hesychast conception that human fulfillment consists precisely in the vision of divine glory, Christologically mediated as the light of Tabor. But if we understand human nature in this radically doxological manner, then we should also characterize sin in its deepest theological character, not as pride or disobedience or sloth, but precisely as an evasion and distortion of humanity's doxological vocation. To sin, as St. Paul put it, is in the first and last analysis precisely to fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We fall short of the glory of God when we do not properly glorify God. And thus to sin is finally simply to be unglorious. Unglorious in, our, in oneself, unglorious in failing to give proper glory to God. Consequently, we should also understand salvation then to be nothing else than the recovery of humanity's doxological vocation and the fulfillment of that vocation in being enfolded in the mutual glorification of the divine persons. Among other biblical sources, the letter to the Hebrews gives us a characterization of Christ's salvific work in a way that coheres with this doxological conception of salvation. In his divinity, Christ is the eternal reflection of the Father's glory. And in his humanity, he is crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. And thus brings many children to glory. That's us. Consequently, the doxological aspect of our Salvific doxological contrition is simply a sharing in the renewed access to divine glory that Christ has won for us through his suffering and death. When we glorify God in the divine liturgy, we claim and enact this access to inner Trinitarian mutual glorification that Christ has won for us through his death, resurrection, ascension, and the sending of the Spirit. At the same time, it must also be the case that our liturgical contrition, our repentance, is a sharing in Christ's salvific work and a participation in some manner in Christ's sinless contrition for our sins. Otherwise, our repentance, which is attested in both scripture and liturgy as an integral feature of our salvation, would be something we achieve on our own rather than a grace we have acquired in Christ. While it is true that we do not find literally and explicitly the characterization of Christ's salvific work as vicarious contrition, in so many words, in either scripture or patristic tradition, we can find the substance of such a notion in both these mediations of divine revelation. In scripture, we find, for example, that Jesus' public ministry begins with an acceptance of John the Baptist baptism for repentance, which he insists on undergoing despite John's pro protest in order to fulfill all righteousness. While some modern scholars have asserted that Jesus could only have done this if he considered himself to be a sinner and in need of repentance, such an interpretation is obviously ruled out by scripture itself as well as by dogmatic Christological doctrine. But then the only alternative is to say that though Jesus himself was sinless, he chose to be in solidarity with sinners, not by joining them in sinning, but in enacting and manifesting a perfect repentance on their behalf. In my book, I show how such a conception is implicitly attested by Cyril of Alexandria, Maximus the Confessor, and Nicholas Cavasilas, among others. In summary, then, if Christ enacts both the fulfillment of humanity's doxological vocation and humanity's perfect repentance 
then our liturgical experience of salvation as doxological contrition is simply a participation in Christ's own vicarious doxological contrition. When we praise God in the liturgy, we praise God in Christ. And when we repent, we repent in Christ. We praise and glorify God by participating in Christ's perfect glorification of the Father and the Spirit. And we repent of our estrangement from divine glory through Christ's intercessory and sinless contrition on our behalf. It is this conception of salvation as participation in Christ's doxological contrition that I propose in my book, Deification Through the Cross. I come now to my second part, Father Schmemann's theology as a basis for a soteriology of doxological contrition. I've just recounted Father Schmemann's influence on the architectonic design of the argument of my book. The entire logic of this design is based on Father Schmemann's insistence that all theology must take liturgical experience as its starting point and goal. Consequently, in elaborating a doctrine of salvation, I began with the assumption that salvation is actually, actually experienced in the liturgy. I sought to describe that liturgical experience of salvation as doxological contrition, and then to test that description in light of the normative witness of scripture and conciliar doctrine. Finally, I endeavored to apply that description systematically to the standard foci of dogmatic theology, Trinitarian theology, Christology, anthropology, and so on. Inasmuch as Father Schmemann was the source of the methodological blueprint of my whole project, it's fair to say that his influence was the most determinative and formative for the project as a whole. That much, I believe, is evident in the book itself. But what I did not have a chance to do within the contents of the book is demonstrate some deep affinities between the material contents of Father Schmemann's theological vision and my conception of doxological contrition as a description of both the content of human salvation and of Christ's own salvific work. A recurrent claim throughout the book is that while the actual words doxological contrition may be a novelty, the substance of this notion is present, hiding in plain sight, as it were, throughout the witness of scripture and tradition. Part of my claim is that the construction of this notion affords an opportunity to synthesize and make explicit elements that are integral to the witness of scripture and tradition, albeit implicitly. So now I'd like to lay out, in an admittedly rudimentary fashion, the basic rationale for the claim that Father Schmemann is in fact an exemplary witness to the theology of salvation as doxological contrition. This claim can be substantiated by noting the constitutive significance in Father Schmemann's theology of some of the central elements of a soteriology of doxological contrition as I've just outlined it, including a doxological anthropology. He's got that in spades. The characterization of sin as essentially anti-doxology. I mean, nobody is more... Um, explicit about that, the conception of salvation as the restoration and perfection of humanity's doxological capacity. And finally, an inchoate articulation of Christ's salvific work as doxological contrition. Let me now offer some brief remarks on each of these themes in turn. The best starting point, I think, for a reading of Father Schmemann's theology <clears throat> as exemplifying a soteriology of doxological contrition is his emphatically doxological conception of the meaning of human existence. According to this conception, the human being is most essentially a worshiping being, homo adorans. This means that every human being is ultimately a priest, a being whose goal and fulfillment consists in offering oneself and the world to God in thanksgiving and praise. It is because the human being is radically ordained to be a priest that the creation as a whole is ordained to be Eucharist. Uh, 
the offering by which priestly humanity blesses God in doxological communion. In Father Schmemann's own words, I quote, the first, the basic definition of man is that he is the priest. The world was created as the matter, the material of one all-embracing Eucharist. And man was created as the priest of the cosmic sacrament. Father Schmemann's radically cosmic conception of the Eucharist, what we can call his Eucharistic cosmology, along with, we, we, with what we can also call his Eucharistic or doxological anthropology, are well known and much celebrated. Less known and much less celebrated is his emphasis on the anti-doxological character of sin. In fact, Father Schmemann's theological vision is perhaps unique in the intensity and consistency of his emphasis that the ultimate essence of all sin is its anti-doxological and anti-Eucharistic character. Anthropologically, sin consists in the forfeiting of humanity's priestly vocation. To sin is to give up the priesthood. Cosmologically, sin annuls the Eucharistic orientation of creation to be a means of worshipful communion with God. He says, I quote, In our perspective, however, the original sin is not primarily that man has disobeyed God. The sin was not that man neglected his religious duties. The only real fall of man is his non-Eucharistic life in a non-Eucharistic world. This emphasis on the anti-doxological character of sin explains Father Schmemann's characteristically mordant put-downs of religiosity. It consistently uses the word religion, often in scare quotes, as a pejorative term. Religion is deeply misguided insofar as it tends to see the fundamental polarity of reality as that between the spiritual and the material, or between the natural and the supernatural. In, do in doing so, religion actually becomes complicit in the original sin of rendering the world non-Eucharistic. Whereas for Schmemann, the only genuine polarity and radical opposition reality is that between a Eucharistic mode of existence and an anti-Eucharistic corruption of existence. Given this perspective, it makes perfect sense that Father Schmemann considers Christian salvation to consist not in some religious refuge from the world, but rather in the restoration of the human being to his priestly vocation and the restoration of the entire creation to its Eucharistic status. Commenting on the opening words of the Eucharistic prayer of the Divine Liturgy, it is fitting and right to sing to you, to bless you, to praise you, to give thanks to you, to worship you in every place of your dominion. Father Schmemann sees these words as simply describing the contents of salvation itself the new life in Christ. This is salvation, to sing to you, to bless you, to praise you, to give thanks to you. He says, and I quote, for Eucharist, thanksgiving and praise is the very form and content of the new life that God granted us when in Christ he reconciled us with himself. Moreover, Father Schmemann, un, Father Schmemann unmistakably intimates that Christ not only grants us the capacity to reclaim our doxological and priestly being, but that he performs in himself this doxological fulfillment of the human being. He does it. As I noted earlier, the Byzantine liturgy correlates the consummation of humanity's glorification, specifically with the event of Christ's ascension and glorification at the right hand of the divine majesty. In a similar vein, Father Schmemann seems to presuppose that it is by ascending with Christ and by participating in his ascension 
that we can reclaim our doxological and priestly vocation. Thus, immediately after the sentences I just quoted, Father Schmimann goes on to say, I quote, we had to ascend to heaven in Christ to see and to understand the creation in its real being as glorification of God, as that responds to divine love in which alone creation be becomes what God wants it to be, thanksgiving, Eucharist, adoration. Elsewhere, Father Schmemann is even more explicit in making the point that it's Christ himself who became the salvific new Adam precisely by being himself the homo adorans which the old Adam failed to be. Christ himself is the exemplary worshiping being. He says, there must be someone in this world there must be someone in this world which rejected God and in this rejection and this blasphemy became a chaos of darkness. There must be someone to stand at its center and to discern, to see it again as full of divine riches, as the cup full of life and joy, as beauty and wisdom, and to thank God for it. This someone is Christ the new Adam who restores that Eucharistic life which I, the old Adam, have rejected and lost, who makes me again what I am and restores the world to me. And he sums up the point even more succinctly in another place by saying of Christ simply, he alone is the perfect Eucharistic being. He alone is the perfect Eucharistic being. At various points in deification through the cross, I relied upon Father Schmemann's conception of the human person as homo adorans to formulate a doxological anthropology as part of my systematic exposition of a soteriology of doxological contrition. However, I did not go on to show how the doxological matrix of Father Schmemann's theological vision also determines his definition of the essential character of sin as anti-doxological as well as his conception of salvation as the restoration of the doxological relation between God and humanity. So I'm happy for this opportunity to fill in this lacuna now. At the same time, I also now wish to make the claim that the substance of my proposal that Christ effects our salvation through his own doxological contrition can find support in Father Schmemann's theology. I just noted that Father Schmemann speaks of Christ as the new Adam, precisely insofar as he enacts in himself the perfection of humanity's doxological and priestly vocation. He is the only perfect Eucharistic being. It is undeniable then that Father Schmemann affirms and even prioritizes the doxological aspect of Christ's salvific work. Christ saves us first and more foremost by his Eucharistic being. But what about contrition? Is there any basis in Father Schmemann's theology for speaking of Christ's salvific contrition on our behalf? Of course, that's a sinless contrition. I believe that there is such a basis and that we can uncover its context in three steps. First, by noting Father Schmemann's own conception of the correlation between doxology and contrition in general. Secondly, by recognizing Father Schmemann's acknowledgement of the intrinsically vicarious nature of Christian repentance, again speaking in general. And thirdly, by discerning at least an inchoate notion of Christ's vicarious repentance in his, in his theology. Let me briefly demonstrate each of these points. First, in Father Schmemann's analysis of the structure of Vespers, we find a clear expression of the cor uh, correlation between doxology and contrition. In this analysis, he identifies the first theme of Vespers as, quote, the rediscovery in adoration and thanksgiving of the world as God's creation. So that's a doxological moment. 
It is within this exposition of the doxological beginning of the Vesper service the Father Shmeman speaks of Christ as the new Adam who fulfills the Eucharistic vocation at which the old Adam had failed. But Father Shmeman then identifies the second theme of Vespers as the perception of the darkness of sin to which we respond in repentance. A repentance that flows directly from the doxological apprehension of creation. So he says the following. Through contrast with the beauty and wonder of creation, however, the darkness and failure of the world is discovered. And this is the second great theme of Vespers. Because we have first seen the beauty of the world, we can now see the ugliness, realize what we have lost, and understand how our whole life and not only some trespasses, has become sin and repent it. In the face of the glory of creation, there must be a tremendous sadness. While in this passage, the acknowledgement of sin and repentance are seen as derivative of doxological vision, elsewhere Father Schmann presents a conception of a mutually reinforcing dialectic between doxology and repentance. In the following passage, the doxological aspect of Christian existence is formulated in the language of eschatological joy and paschal feasting. Yet this doxological aspect is also conceived as both leading to and deriving from the church's ongoing repentance. So let me read you this passage. He says, therefore, the whole of the church is at the same time the gift of forgiveness, the joy of the world to come, and also an inescapably a constant repentance. The feast is impossible without the fast. And the fast is precisely repentance and return. The saving experience of sadness and exile. Notice the exact words here, the saving experience of sadness and exile. He continues, the church is the gift of the kingdom, yet it is this very gift that makes obvious our absence for the, from the kingdom, our alienation from God. It is repentance that takes us again and again into the joy of the Paschal banquet. So repentance, joy, joy, repentance, it goes both ways. I also want to flag here that Father Shmeyman speaks of repentance in the language of return. As I just quoted, the fast is precisely repentance and return, and I'll return to the significance of that in a minute. Secondly, then, if the first element of a conception of doxological contrition can be found in Father Shmeyman's articulation of a correlation of doxology and repentance, the second element can be identified as an implicit conception that Christian repentance in its very nature is a vicarious repentance. What do I mean by that? I mean, that, you know, as Christians, we do not repent only for our individual sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Just like Christ was not concerned with his own sins because he had none, but with the sins of the whole world. Admittedly, this is not a prominent theme in Father Schmemann's work, at least not explicitly so, but there's at least one significant expression of this notion that can indicate how such a conception fits in well with his theological vision. I just quoted the passage in which Father Schmemann identifies the second theme of Vespers as the darkness of the world that evokes our repentance. In that same essay, he then goes on to describe the liturgical performance of this repentance as follows. And he's speaking again of Vespers. The lights are now extinguished. The royal doors of the sanctuary are closed. The celebrant has put off his vestments. It is the naked and suffering man who cries outside of paradise who in full awareness of his exile, of his betrayal, of his darkness, 
says to God, out of the deep have I cried unto thee, O Lord. In the face of the glory of creation, there must be a tremendous sadness. God has given us another day and we can see just how we have destroyed this gift of his. We are not nice Christians come apart from the ugly world. If we do not stand precisely as representatives of this world, as indeed the world itself, if we do not bear the whole burden of this day, our piety may still be pious, but it's not Christian. Now this is an intriguing passage, one that is redolent of Father Schmemann's stylistic tendency toward highly condensed and lapidary articulations of concepts that would otherwise be elaborated in much more detailed exposition. The obvious point he's making is that we're all sinners. But without explicit transition from one idea to the next, he has simply elided this notion that we're all sinners, including Christians, with the notion that as distinctly Christian sinners, we stand as representatives of the whole sinful world not just as individuals who have our own private sins, but as representatives of the whole sinful world. And in some way, he says, as the sinful world itself. The fact that Father Schmemann draws no attention at all to the fact that he's linking the notion of the sinfulness of every individual Christian with the distinct notion of the sinful Christian as representing and identifying with all the sin of the whole world simply reinforces the conflation of these two points. Without any fanfare in his characteristically elusive rather than expository style, Schmemann here seems to be channeling the famous lines uttered by Father Sosima and Dostoevsky's the, brother, the Brothers Karamazov. There is only one way to salvation, and that is to make yourself responsible for all men's sins. As soon as you make yourself responsible in all sincerity for everything and for everyone, you will see at once that this is really so and that you are guilty on behalf of all and for all. Note that in Father Zosima's words, making oneself responsible for the sins of all is not only identified with salvation, but indeed as the only way to salvation. A similar conception seems to be operative in the passage from Father Schmemann that I just quoted. Admittedly, the words vicarious repentance do not appear here, do not appear in Father Schmemann's description of the repentant sinner standing as representative of the sin of all the world. But this description does not make sense without presupposing this notion. How else can an individual sinner stand as a representative of this world, in, as indeed the world itself, he says, except by considering oneself somehow responsible for the sins of all? Finally, we come down to the question of whether we can find in Father Schmemann's writings a basis for speaking specifically of Christ's vicarious contrition. We have already seen that Father Schmemann does articulate a conception of Christ's vicarious doxology the notion that Christ is the uniquely perfect Eucharistic being, the new Adam who alone knows how to perfectly praise God and offer the world to God in thanksgiving. But we can also find a basis for the claim that Christ's vicarious doxology includes an element of vicarious contrition on behalf of human sin. But to do this, we again have to be sensitive to the distinct character of Father Schmemann's style of thought and articulation, his tendency to bypass logical explanation in favor of dramatic performative assertions. To that extent, it's fair to say that his style is more proclamatory and charismatic than expository and explanatory. With regard to the question of Christ's vicarious contrition, the relevant proclamation that Father Schmemann makes is that Christ is our return from sin to God. Now, it just so happens that return is the literal translation of the Hebrew word shuv that is regularly translated into our English as repent. In the Old Testament, the notion of return is intrinsic to the conception of repentance. 
And this correlation is presupposed in both the Greek Septuagint and the New Testament. This conception of repentance as return, repent Israel, return to your God, um, is central to my conception of Christ's vicarious contrition. By saying that Christ saves us through his vicarious contrition, I'm thus saying that Christ performs in himself our return from sin to God. Now, to my knowledge, Father Shmima nor explicitly alludes to the biblical provenance of the understanding of repentance as return. But this makes it even more remarkable that he simply presupposes it. I've already noted how this presupposition is operative in his description of Vespers, where he explicitly identifies repentance with return. Now, given this presupposition, it's highly significant that Father Schmemann speaks of Christ as performing in himself our return from sin to God. Note the following passage in which he speaks of Christ as not only granting us forgiveness, but as being our forgiveness. And being our forgiveness precisely by enacting in himself our return to God. So in his exposition of baptism, he says the following. The sacrament of forgiveness is baptism, not because it operates a juridical removal of guilt, but because it is baptism into Jesus Christ, who is the forgiveness. The sin of all sins, the truly original sin, is not a transgression of rules, first of all, but first of all, the deviation of man's love and his alienation from God. And in Christ, this sin is forgiven, not in the sense that God has forgotten it, but because in Christ, man has returned to God. In Christ, man has returned to God. And has returned to God because he has loved him and found in him the only true object of love and life. Repentance is thus the return. Here again, he's he's describing defining repentance as return. Repentance is thus the return of our love, of our life to God, and this return is possible in Christ because he reveals to us the true life and makes us aware of our exile and condemnation. To believe in Christ is to repent, to change radically the very mind of our life, to see it as sin and death, and to believe in him is to accept the joyful revelation that in him forgiveness and reconciliation have been given. In this passage, we see that Father Schmemann, while entirely conflating the language of repentance and return, characterizes the entirety of Christian life as a life of repentance and return to God. He says simply, to believe in Christ is to repent. Repentance is thus not a preamble or a prerequisite to salvation, it is the very content of salvation. At the same time, Father Schmemann is clear that our repentance, our return to God, is not only made possible because of Christ, but takes place in Christ. He is our return. If our repentance is our return to God and our return to God happens in Christ, then our repentance happens in Christ. Christ is our forgiveness, as Father Schmemann says, because he's also our repentance, our return to God. Surely we find here the essential content of the conception of Christ's vicarious repentance, even if we don't find exactly these words. This conception, along with Father Schmemann's depiction of Christ's saving doxology on humanity's behalf and his characterization of Christian life as a dialectic of praise and repentance, makes him an eloquent witness to the soteriology of doxological contrition that I'm proposing. I come now to my conclusion. At the outset of my reflections tonight, I noted that the petition of the psalmist restored to me the joy of salvation, encapsulates the entirety of my proposal of a soteriology of doxological contrition. The Christian experience of salvation consists ultimately in the joy of glorifying God, which also includes a repentance that seeks a return from the sin of falling short of and distorting divine glory. But to define salvation in this way is to raise the question of whether such a conscious experience of salvation, precisely as doxological joy, is genuinely possible in a largely joyless world, a world whose joylessness has become all the more manifest in the present difficult circumstances 
that threaten to suffocate our Christian joy. Here again we find both wisdom and inspiration in the theological vision of Father Schmemann. I'd like to conclude with some remarks on Father Schmemann's treatment of the theme of Christian joy and of Christian salvation precisely as joy. To begin with, we must recall Father Schmemann's insistence that Christianity cannot dispense with joy. Among many examples of this insistence, we can cite his assertion that, quote, from its very beginning, Christianity has been the proclamation of joy, of the only possible joy on earth. Without the proclamation of this joy, Christianity is incomprehensible. But lest we interpret this statement as advocating for a superficial and Pollyannish emotionality, we have to see it in dialectical relation to Father Schmemann's contention that Christianity brings to an end the self-sufficiency of any purely natural joy. The world that killed Christ and that still continues to reject him has revealed itself to be a world that cannot sustain true joy. Therefore, Father Schmemann informs us, quote, Christianity is the end of all natural joy. It revealed its impossibility, its futility, its sadness. The cross of Christ signified an end of all natural rejoicing. Now, if Christianity is both the proclamation of true joy and the end of merely natural joy, then Christian joy must consist precisely in a conversion from merely natural joy to a true joy that encompasses but altogether transcends natural joy. Christian joy, therefore, which is the joy of salvation in Christ, is a paschal journey through which we die to merely natural joy and rise to the all-encompassing and indestructible joy of Christ's resurrection. That is why Father Schmemann says that to enter into the joy of Christ entails, quote, a conversion to another reality. The one who seeks this, this joy must ascend to heaven where Christ has ascended. Now, to speak of Christian joy as conversion is also to define it as repentance, a repentance that forsakes the joylessness of sin and the miserable futility of self-sufficiency and ascends with Christ into his glory. Such a joy does not forsake the world, nor does it dissipate itself by always condemning the world, but rather expresses its victory over the sinful world precisely by interceding for this world and loving it in Christ. The church is not a society of escape, Father Schmemann reminds us from this world to a taste of the mystical bliss of eternity. And thus it is the very joy of the kingdom that makes us remember the world and pray for it. It is the very communion with the Holy Spirit that enables us to love the world with the love of Christ. If we accept Father Schmemann's witness to the indispensability of Christian joy, then we have to recognize that the psalmist's prayer, restore to me the joy of your salvation, has already been fully answered in Christ our Savior. To, con to confess Christ as Savior is to partake of the joy of his resurrection and to disseminate that joy. But this is not a matter of superficial emotionality, but rather an effort of constant conversion. Christian joy is a repentance whose starting point and end point is always the glory of the risen Christ. Christian salvation is always an entrance into the joy of the Lord through a doxological contrition that is paradigmatically enacted and effected above all in the Eucharist, which Father Schmemann called the sacrament of joy. Regardless of how we feel then about our personal misfortunes, or the world's lamentable condition, we are called always to a paschal ascesis of joy that is intrinsic to the experience of Christian salvation as doxological 
contrition. Thank you very much. This uh, 39th annual Father Alexander Schmemann Memorial Lecture, as you heard earlier, concludes our centennial year, uh, marking his birth in Tallinn, Estonia. And in various ways, we've reflected throughout this year on the great contributions of our former and beloved Dean. One of my personal goals as we kept this year was to actually conclude the year as we've actually done this evening. Maybe not so much with intention, but certainly with content. I'd spoken with uh, Peter Butenyev earlier as we were talking about things uh, that we could do during this year. And I said to Peter, I said, one of my goals is to actually focus on the ecumenical contribution that Father Alexander has made. It's easy to highlight his influence within our Orthodox Christian community, but we often overlook exactly how far and deep and much appreciated his reach has been into Roman Catholic circles, Anglicans, Lutherans, and even evangelicals. It's remarkable. And it's one of those things, again, which makes Father Alexander's voice, which we hear now more frequently than ever, thanks to modern digitization, but also his written words. They continue to speak, and they speak again not only to the Orthodox, but beyond in different communions. I'll give you just a little story. One of the former uh, Schmemann lecturers, uh, Professor David Fagerberg, your colleague at Notre Dame, he introduced a community of Norbertine canonesses in California to Father Schmemann. And they have become completely immersed in his theology. They, they take everything that they can get. And in fact, uh, they asked if we could supply them through SVS Press a copy of Schmemann's book, The Eucharist, that they could give to every Roman Catholic bishop in America prior to their creation this summer of the encyclical through the US Catholic Bishops Conference. Now that's really quite remarkable. Father Alexander, as we all know, and we heard clearly this evening through your presentation, Father Khalid, that we are called to become more godlike and more God-centered. That's really the, the underscoring of just about everything that we discover in the theology, especially the liturgical theology of Father Alexander. Father Khalid, your words this evening delivered to us show us once again the ecumenical reach and the influence of Father Alexander, especially within your own Melkite Greek Catholic tradition. Father Alexander, I'm told that on his deathbed when he received the Eucharist for the last time, gathered all his strength and rallied and said with a clear voice, Amen, Amen, Amen. And tonight, as again you've illuminated the figure of Father Alexander. We as a community say amen to what you have presented us this night. Amen to your own words. Tonight, we also say to you, thank you. Shukran, Abuna, shukran. And I also want to thank our many, many listeners, hundreds of listeners who are participating with us tonight virtually. We thank you. And if you've appreciated this evening's lecture as much as the rest of us, I would encourage those of you tuning in virtually to pray for us, as I know that you do, but also 
Go to our website and make a financial contribution. Send in an old-fashioned check if you like. We take those too. We even take cash. We take credit card. We take it all. We haven't gotten to Bitcoin yet, but we're working on that one. <laughs> that helps us to fulfill the mission of St. Vladimir Seminary. It helps us to do what we have done tonight. And this was really a gem. And I repeat once again, we can't thank you enough. For those of you who are here with us, there is a reception that will follow in the lower level of this Rangos building. And I have a, another announcement to make to this community. It's been a full week and we're headed for another full week. And so there are no matins in the morning. You can sleep in. I thought I'd get some applause on that one, right? You know? So once again, we'll stand shortly and sing It's Truly Meet. I want to thank you again for really a remarkable effort uh, that you've put together here and that you've made Father Alexander literally sort of stand among us this evening. So brilliantly done.